first began describing the other America, he was speaking to the way America had created a separate and subordinated society for the poor, and then completely ignored them. Later, Oscar Lewis, in his description of poor Mexican families, introduced the notion of a subculture of poverty that became shortened to the culture of poverty. I always say, if poverty is a culture, then most of the world is in that culture. Because most of the world is in poverty. Today, the use of the term culture of poverty bothers me because consultants and so-called experts are making money from desperate schools and districts by perpetuating this myth. If the teachers and administrators are led to believe that the children are so deviant and so strange that they cannot be treated with dignity and humanity. They're led to believe that we cannot place high academic expectations on them and that the primary purpose of school is to bring order to their lives. We should be clear that there is something learned in the midst of poverty. But poverty is a part of a dialectic relationship created by social values that permit huge disparities in health and well-being. Thus, the poverty that exists in one part of the world, or one, excuse me, is related to the affluence in another part. Similarly, the poverty that exists on one side of town is related to the affluence and the greed on the other side. When one segment of a society regularly and consistently has access to the best schools, the best health care, the best communities, and social resources, it means that the other segments lack that access. So rather than a culture of poverty, what we see in schools is what Martin Haberman calls the pedagogy of poverty. And he identifies some 14 specific acts that traditionally constitute the core functions of urban <coughs> teaching. I'm going to go through these quickly. And they include things like giving information, asking questions, giving directions, making assignments, monitoring seat work, reviewing assignments, giving tests, reviewing tests, signing homework, reviewing homework, settling disputes, punishing noncompliance, marking papers, giving grades. Now there are times when any one of these activities might have a beneficial effect. But Haberman writes, taken together and performed to the systematic exclusion of other acts, they do not work. This pedagogy of poverty is sufficiently powerful to undermine the implementation of any re reform effort because it defines the way that people spend their time, the nature of the behaviors they practice, and the basis of their self-concept as learners. Essentially, it is a pedagogy in which learners can succeed without becoming either involved or thoughtful. So if you've ever been in a classroom where the teacher has trouble maintaining control of the kids, and so one of the ways to maintain control is you say, okay, I've had it. Take out a piece of paper. You're going to write 500 times. I will listen to the teacher, right? And what happens is, you know, the kids start with, I, 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 the kids who actually like that assignment are the kids who are struggling academically. Because this is the one thing they can do. And they, they turn those papers in so proudly, Miss Wilson, get my papers, right? But they can do that. But you don't have to be intellectually engaged to do that. And so this is what Haberman is saying, this, this pedagogy turns out to be you're just kind of doing to fill out this paper, you know, mark this. Um, give them some more seat work. They don't have to get their minds in gear to do a lot of that. Further, what Haberman asserts is that the pedagogy of poverty appeals to those who didn't do that well in school themselves. It appeals to those who rely on common sense rather than thoughtful analysis. It appeals to those who fear poor children. 
and children of color. And as a result, they are often obsessed with control. <coughs> it appeals to those who are unaware of the full range of pedagogical options. There are other things you can be doing. Now, I've focused on these persistent myths about why poor children and children of color, particularly African American and Latino children, experience school failure and continue to lag behind their white counterparts. Because I think it's important for us to begin to change the discourse. Indeed, if we can control the discourse, we can control thinking. So we can call a strategic reinvestment, but what we really mean is firing people from their jobs. <laughs> We're going to engage in some strategic reinvestments. The next thing you know, you got a little pink slip. You've been strategically reinvested. <laughs> we can call it a personal savings account when what we're actually referencing is the dismantling of Social Security, the one safety net that most of the poor can count on. We can call it no child left behind, when what we mean is disinvesting from public education and cradle to grave testing. So I argue that we need to change the discourse from achievement gap to what I term an education Debt. The debt language places the onus on under, uh, of underachievement on, excuse me, the gap language places the onus of underachievement on the students, on their families, and on some cases individual teachers. It constructs the students as defective and lacking. It admonishes them that they need to catch up. But when we speak of an education debt, we move to a discourse that holds us all accountable. It reminds us that we have accumulated this problem as a result of centuries of neglect and outright denial of education to entire groups of students. I don't know how many of you know this, but we didn't have universal secondary schooling for black children in this country until the late 1960s. Not 1860s. There were places in this country where there was no secondary school for black children to attend. It's interesting to me that one of those places is Jefferson County, um, Kentucky. And yet here is Jefferson County folded into this last lawsuit with Seattle about not using race consciousness. They use race consciousness to keep the kids out of school. So I think it's important for us to understand we didn't just start doing this. It reminds us that we have consistent